September 16th is National POW and MI Recognition Day, where POWs are honored, where the missing in action are remembered. What better day would there be to bring us together to dedicate this particular set of panels, and that's why we're here today. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I would uh, encourage you to continue eating your, your dessert there that uh, Doc Virgits from the uh, PE department does not recommend you eat for health purposes, uh, but we don't pay attention to them on days like this. Most of the time we do pay attention to them, but enjoy the rest of your uh, meal and, and then again the, uh, the cake that is, that is there. But I'd like to go ahead and introduce Mr. Sid Stockdale, who's going to share with us a couple of thoughts. He's the second of four sons of Admiral James and Sybil Stockdale. Sid was born in the dispensary at the Naval Test Pilot School in Patuxet River, Maryland in 1954. And although never a member of the armed services himself, he certainly feels rightfully that he understands and has a unique perspective on the, on the military. And being a part of the Stockdale family, that certainly is absolutely true. During his 40-year career, as a high school teacher, history teacher, with experience in both public and private schools. He also coached ice hockey, crew, and football along the way. And he currently teaches at the Albuquerque Academy in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And we are very, very honored to have Sid Stockdale with us this afternoon. Sid, please come up. Thank you so much, Art. Um, Colonel Athens, pleasure to be here. And it's uh, such a beautiful day. And um, I'm so excited to have the, uh, the new display here at the Naval Academy. It's, it's really gorgeous. And I want to thank everybody who was responsible for making that happen. It's, it's just fantastic. Now, I know I'm, I'm, I'm uh, in a room full of people who know an awful lot about my parents' stories. Um, so what I wanted to do is I wanted to take a little uh, shift gears a little bit and I wanted to tell you a couple of uh, family stories uh, with a little bit of humor um, and uh, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna go back to the uh, summer of 1973 uh, prisoners were released in February of 1973 I was a senior in high school when my father came home and uh, that following summer as everyone was settling in to having them home it was very, very exciting there in the town of Coronado. Um, I think that there were seven or eight POWs who returned to Coronado to their families there. And uh, the celebratory mood was everywhere. You could just, it was palpable, you could feel it. And the uh, local police department had kind of an unwritten code that was uh, in place that uh, said basically, we want these, these guys are coming home, they're gonna, they're gonna wanna enjoy their freedom. <laughs> There's gonna be a lot of celebration. We want to keep them safe, but we don't want anybody to end up in jail. Okay, because obviously that would be a real, that would be kind of a problem, right? Throwing them back in jail. Um, and uh, that summer I was, I was working as a lifeguard down at the beach in Coronado. And uh, I remember one evening in particular, mom and dad got all dressed up and they went out to the officers club at North Island and they went to a big gala event out there. And uh, I went to bed and uh, about 2 a.m. I was woken up. Just, I was dead asleep. And I hear my dad is going, hey, hey, hey. Uh, and I open my eyes and here's my dad and he's in dress white uniform over me laughing laughing hysterically and uh oh just groggy said you got to go down and get your mom at the police station <laughs> <laughs> and i was just I, I thought i was dreaming you know i thought this can't be real oh, uh, uh, oh okay all right all right and so i, I get up and I'm, I'm literally sleepwalking just kind of all right i'll get up and I start heading down the stairs uh, uh, towards the front door, and my dad is just hysterical behind me, and he says, hey, 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 you're looking good, but 
you better put some clothes on, okay? <laughs> and it was at that point where I kind of came to and I realized I was stark naked going out the front door. Uh, anyway, um, story ends well. I went down and got mom and uh, put some clothes on first. And, uh, but that was a, a, just a, a great, great time uh, and a wonderful, a um, lot of great memories of, of getting to know my dad again and having my mother be in a different role and everybody very, very relaxed. Um, <clears throat> shift gear is one other story. Uh, later in life, uh, and uh, year was about 2003, and my dad was beginning to show signs of early Alzheimer. Um, and that took a lot of getting used to. Fortunately, we, as we said, we were, I was, we were still in Coronado and uh, uh, people were watching out for him as he was walking around and then eventually lost his driver's license and he got this three-wheeled scooter, this electric cart that he would cruise around town on. And uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, once a fighter pilot, all of, always a fighter pilot, you know, what did he want? He wanted speed. That's what he wanted. And so I remember one time going down to the locksmith working on a project and the, uh, the fellow behind the counter said, you know, Sid, your dad comes in here about every two or three weeks and he wants, he keeps asking me to tinker with the governor on his electric cart so he can get the thing really going, really blasting it. And um, yeah, that was when I said, uh-oh, we're in for it now. <laughs> Uh, and sure enough, about two weeks later, I was at home and I got a telephone call from the manager down at the Vaughn's grocery store. And <laughs> I said, hello, he said, uh, Sid, I just wanted to let you know that your dad is down here racing up and down the aisles in the grocery store and he's scaring the heck out of everybody. <laughs> I said, okay, that's great. I'll, I'll be right down. I'll be right down, no problem. Um, well. Yeah, on a more serious note, uh, I am uh, very, very thankful that uh, all of the legacy of my parents is held in trust here, preserved and passed on at the Stockdale Center and the U.S. Naval Academy. Uh, it's, it's most appropriate and um, it means a great deal to our family and I want to thank everybody very much for making that happen. So thank you. So, so I asked Sid for permission to do this. Um, I, I'm going to give him something here in a moment, but he's going to have to survive this next part. And, and that is whether he'd be willing to entertain questions. And uh, this is a great opportunity to, to ask about that legacy of, of Admiral and Mrs. Stockdale. And I can't emphasize enough that one of the great things about this set of panels, it's not just about Admiral Stockdale, it's about that other, that other partner with him over all those years, uh, Sybil Stockdale, and what she contributed to the nation uh, as a whole. But, but Sid is willing to answer a, a couple of questions if, if you have them. There are midshipmen here, and if you teach in the classroom with midshipmen, you know, you don't let the class go until someone asks a question. So someone's going to have to uh, ask a, at least one question, but it is really a great opportunity. So, Sid, I'll, I'll let you call on whoever might ask a question. Sid, what did your family and your mother hear and know during the time when your dad was in prison? Uh, did you hear the question, Arnie? Um, you might want to repeat it just so it gets on the camera. Oh, uh, the question was, um, what did uh, my mother and our family know um, about my father's circumstances? Is that the question? Yeah, while he was in prison. Um, you, uh, Dad was MIA uh, for roughly about six months. Uh, when I got the news, it was, um, I was uh, 11, and it was, you know, his plane was shot down, and and um, uh, one of the other pilots saw a parachute, and that was the extent of it. Um, and um, that was very, very difficult, of course, obviously, for a small boy, anybody, really. But um, 
And then about, um, I, again, I say about six months because um, what happened was that mom got notification from the Pentagon that there was a, um, a newspaper article in a Soviet newspaper. Uh, it was a photograph, very grainy photograph, of a man standing out in front of a, a hospital clinic. And uh, the, the name, the spelling of the name was all kind of jumbled up, but uh, they, had, they were very confident that that was my father. And that was the first real hard evidence we had that he had survived and that he was there. Um, my mother received, uh, she, she received the first letter from dad. He was, he was shot down in September of 65 and she received the first letter in, I believe, February of 66. Matter of fact, I know it's February 6th. And um, it, that's when it was written. I don't think it was received until maybe three or four weeks later. Um, and uh, that's the, that infamous letter <clears throat> where dad um, writes that uh, has a line in there that's signaling to mom. Vietnam is a very um, cold country. We think of it as a tropical country, but it's actually cold. Um, and that oftentimes it's, there can be darkness even at noon. And that was the line, of course, that mom recognizes the title of the, the Kessler novel, Darkness at Noon. It's a, about a political prison situation and torture. And um, that was the in, first indication that, of what things were really like. And it also signaled, um, to my mom and to others that uh, dad was gonna to try to communicate and that he was uh, gonna be open to be watching for signals, um, communications in letters. Um, and it led to a very amazing sequence of events. Um, and I, my parents wrote about it, of course, in their book. Um, and it began with uh, um, the turning point was a, my mother met with a fellow in the Pentagon, Dick Burris, and he was a CIA fellow, and he said, Mrs. Stockdale, we'd like to communicate with your husband, um, but if we do this, if he gets caught with this information, it would be espionage charges, and he would probably be put to death. And, she, and so I want you, he said, I want you to go and think about it, and then let me know if you want to go forward with this. And she thought about it, and she said, well, he would want me to do this. And so um, they, they, they had a little, um, they put together a little plan. Um, my dad received a letter. My mother wrote letters every week to my dad. Uh, and they went through the uh, International Red Cross. Um, and they sent this one letter my dad received, and it said, um, you know, dear Sib, or, um, or excuse me, from my mom, uh, dear Jim, all is well here. The boys are fine. School is going well. Um, your mother dropped by for a visit out of the blue the other day. I've enclosed a photograph of her in this letter. Uh, and my father read this letter and he realized this is very strange. Um, you know, his mother never did anything spontaneously. And the photograph was not of his mother. It was of another woman. And he thought he was, he thought initially that he was kind of losing his marbles. And, you know, by then he'd, he'd lost a lot of weight. He'd been tortured. He was really down and out. And so he thought about just ripping up the photograph, throwing it, forgetting about the whole thing and going on. And then he uh, recalled that uh, he had been trained in, in survival school to never throw anything away. If you get something and you're not sure what to do with it, soak it in urine. So he had, he was in solitary and he had this little bucket he used as a toilet and he put the photo in there and he just forgot about it for, you know, 24 hours. And after about 24 hours, he happened to look at it and the back of the photograph was beginning to transform and a message began to appear on the back of the photograph and it said, um, peel back the, the back of this. It was a Polaroid picture, so you can picture it. Peel back the back of this and you will find a piece of secret carbon paper 
um, to be used for secret communication. Um, begin any, date any uh, letter with a message it, with an odd date, begin it, um, dear Sib, and, and sign it off by, you, you know, your adoring husband. Uh, and then it went on to give specific instructions how to use this, this piece of carbon paper that he then stashed and he had to, got an opportunity in the next two weeks to write a letter himself. And so he, you know, used the piece of carbon paper. Basically what happens is you, they give you a form to write on. He sneaks his piece of carbon paper out of God knows where. He puts it down when the guard's not looking. He puts a second piece of paper on top and he, he has turned the letter this way so it's crosswise. And then he begins to write. Uh, tor experts in torture, leg iron 16 hours a day, all the messages, and you take this away, and here's a benign letter of how wonderful everything is, but it's got an embedded message in it. The letter gets folded up, put in the mail, ends up in our mailbox at A Avenue in Coronado. Um, my mother receives it. It's got an odd date. She drives across Coronado to the uh, Naval headquarters there and gives it to the people who take it to the Pentagon who treat it with chemicals and the message comes up. And so so this is this began this whole process. It was the start of a process that then evolved over time. Uh, my mother was also coding letters uh, to my dad. So they had a coding system um, that was numerical um, and embedded letters so that she could send him, write him what appeared to be a very normal letter, but of course buried within it were these messages once you knew the code and how to read it. Uh, and then it evolved eventually, of course, much more sophisticated as in the film that, that uh, Colonel Athens was mentioning, the Smithsonian film, uh, to recently declassified uh, information that, whereby they were, among other things, uh, burying little micro dots in boxes of cereal that they were sending to them, um, actually sending components in pieces for a small radio receiver, uh, transmitter. Um, it became very, very, um, it was a rich source of communication both for uh, the people in the Pentagon, and of course, a great source of strength for the guys who were in prison. My father didn't, he received so much confidence and such a boost of energy when he realized, you know, I, 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 I can, I'm getting back at these guys. I'm controlling the situation that would otherwise be, uh, be almost uh, insurmountable. So, hope that answers your question. I went on a little long. He, you know, he, he did. Of course, they were all in communication in the prison, right. you know, the famous tap code. And, um, I, you know, I don't know the truth of who was involved and who wasn't and how those decisions were made uh, because the, 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 that information, the micro dot and that level, I, did, I never knew that. I never knew that until it was released after the 40 year, 40th year anniversary when it was declassified. Um, and of course, that meant that my father was never able to write about it or speak about it. And so I don't know. I don't know who would have been involved with that. I know there were some. I mean, there had to be some. You know, the, the escape um, guys who escaped had to know that there was a means of communication. Um, there were, but I don't know how many and who that was. Uh, sorry, I can't, I can't provide much detail there. Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> Let me channel Dad. No. <laughs> no. Um. That is. Uh, I've often thought about how hard that must have been for my mother, because you know she was 
very, very um, involved, that's an understatement, in not only secret communication, but all of the uh, public relations that were going on in terms of getting word out about the real treatment of the POWs. Uh, and that was a important, and um, that organization was fantastic uh, in what they accomplished. So when my father came home, and all of a sudden the spotlight went boom right on him, which I, and, I mean, my mother, she was probably, I know, never, she never said it, but I knew she was kind of thrilled to have the, I mean, obviously dad was home, pressure was off, things were gonna return to normal, but, um, you know, that, that's, that's hard to do. It's hard to give up something like that. Um, she had other, she, she got involved with, you know, civic uh, uh, organizations and, but I, I think it was, I think it was both a blessing and a curse kind of, you know, I mean, it, it was, it was uh, I think kind of hard for her. Um, that the story of those women and their organization and what they achieved is, just now beginning to really kind of come to light. Um, we're, um, I've been working with an author who is uh, just now signing a book deal that's about um, that organization and mom and I'm really hoping that that's gonna take off and that it will, that it will be something that people will really, you know, find fascinating, which I, I think they will. So I'm optimistic about that. Hey, Sid, I, I'm going to mention this. Uh, two comments, not a question. Harry Martini, um, in the class of 71, here with my wife, Jane. Um, in 1970, at the Army Navy game, as a senior midshipman, uh, we actually had your mother as a guest at halftime when she was rolling out this whole POW MIA thing. And I have to go back and look at the history of when this all started in commemoration and with all the, the, the flag, everything. But it was a big deal. Bracelets first came out, and uh, it was just an amazing event. I met her from a distance, but I have to tell you that many years later, during my five years, 11 months, uh, one day, and one hour at the Pentagon, which your dad used to very much affectionately call the world's largest adult daycare center, <laughs> he and your mother were at the book signing of Love and War and the Pentagon. I called Gene and said, hey, guess who's coming for the new, whatever it was, book signing, and it was absolutely, in that five years, 11 months, one day, one hour, my highlight, our highlight, of getting to go down there, we were a little early, and they were there. So we spent five, 10 minutes with your mom and dad, talking about a lot of things. It was a wonderful moment for both of us. Such kind, warm, and loving people, that I know you know this, but from my perspective, having met your mother in 1970, see it her and dad in 1992 was an absolute thrill for both of us. So I just want to make that comment. No question except yeah. to tell you it was a big deal in my Navy career oh. to meet your dad and mom in person. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And just let me add a PS to that. Um, Perry called and said, get the book. Get the book. I just read it. We both just read it. They'll find it for us. And um, we shuffled up and again talked to them. And I just Well, it certainly was. Um, <laughs> when Dad first got home, he was, you can imagine, uh, he was, it was kind of a shock for us to be sitting around the dining room table, you know, having a cup of coffee at breakfast. And the first thing he did was he installed a whiteboard in the, in the, right there in, next to the table. 
and he began talking about his prison experiences. People always say, you know, well, I bet he didn't want to talk about it. And I was like, no, just the opposite. Uh, from an early age, he's, we, we all got the story about, you know, this was the tap code, this is where they were, this is what the shape of the prison was like. And eventually, as we got older, of course, then we were, we were definitely exposed to Epictetus and the Stoics. And um, uh, it, was, it was always a treat when he would um, begin just having a conversation with us about that because it was such a powerful philosophy, such a powerful message for him. And he always, always emphasized, you know, this, this is what saved me. This is what gave me the strength to get through this. And um, uh, I've, I've always, I mean, I teach history. Uh, I got a master's degree at uh, St. John's College. So we read an awful lot of classics. And um, among them, of course, was the Enchiridion. And uh, so, yeah, it's a... Uh, yeah, no, it's a very, very important part of our, our growing up and, and our life, no question about it. Yeah. Did I answer your question? Okay. Well, like I said, uh, any other questions? Thank you so much. Uh, it's really uh, a great, like I said, a fantastic honor to be here with all of you and, uh, and what the Stockdale Center is doing for the brigade and for the Navy. Um, it's, it's spectacular. And I know that my mother and my father very, very much appreciate all of your great work. So thank you. So over the years, we've developed a, a gift for special people. And uh, we call it our moral compass. It says on it the Vice Admiral James B. Stockdale Center for Ethical Leadership, U.S. Naval Academy. And, and your dad helps us to remember how important that, uh, that moral compass is, and your, and your mom as well. And we want you to have one of them. Thank you so, so much. Thank you, Sid. Thank you. So, so I'm going to close with uh, what, one final thought to, to wrap us up this afternoon. I, I was speaking to a group of, uh, of FBI special agents, and I mentioned Admiral Stockdale a number of times in my, in my presentation. And one of those special agents came up to me afterwards, and he said, uh, you know, there are three key words in, in my life and my family's life. And, and I said, well, what, what are those? And he said, uh, return with honor. Now, you might remember that, and you'll see it on the panel, return with honor was the motto, the vision, the intent of the POWs led by Admiral Stockdale, to come home, but to come home honorably. And he said, I was so taken by those three words, this special agent said, that, that I actually put them on a sign above our door in our house on the inside so that my children, my wife and I, the last thing we would see as we walked out the door were those words, return with honor. And he said, I wanted to make sure that particularly my children thought about those words as they went out to whatever they were going to do, that their responsibility was to return with honor. So I said, that, that guy's got a great idea. Many of you know I have 10 children, and so I got a lot of them that I'm interested in their moral development. And I decided we would put up a wooden plaque above our door inside of the house. One of my sons is very good with wood crafting. And, and he made it look like it was almost a panel from a POW type of setting. And it has those words, return with honor. And we talked about what does that actually mean, that it's the last thing you see. And when you come back home, you can come back knowing that you did right as you went out. And we just recently put it above the door of the exit of the main door of the Stockdale Center. So if you ever are in the Stockdale Center as you walk out the main door, that's what you see above is return with honor. As I think about the panels, as I think about Admiral Stockdale and Mrs. Stockdale, I, I hope and pray that that's all of our desires, that as we walk out every day in our journey, that our real aim will be to return with honor, to really honor that legacy that those two incredible people have, have left us that we get to maintain here at the Naval Academy and everywhere we go. And as you go out today, 
it's not physically out there, but if you think about it, as you go out the door, return with honor. That's what I think Admiral Stockdale and Mrs. Stockdale would want from us as we live out our lives and encourage others to do the same. So again, Sid, I can't thank you enough for being with us. Uh, Nancy, thank you for joining him. And again, Jamie, for making it all possible by putting your talents into this and for the staff who worked as a team to, to make this a, a, a possibility. And for all of you taking time out to honor Admiral and Mrs. Stockdale, that means a lot to us. So if you haven't eaten your chocolate cake, there's still time to do that. I, I, I think they can bring coffee out if you haven't gotten coffee. You're, you're welcome to stay here as, as long as you would like to have a chance to say hello to Sid. But again, thank you for being with us, and God bless you.